Many have been touted as game changers, but have any really changed the game? We bring you an update on the most promising coronavirus treatment. This is Coronavirus, the latest from The Telegraph. I'm Theodora Leloudis. The world is marking a very strange first anniversary. It's now been more than a year since the first human was recorded as having been infected with the new coronavirus. And even though it's been over 12 months since that resident of Hubei province in China contracted the virus, there's currently very few known treatments. The steroid dexamethasone has been shown to reduce deaths in patients hospitalised with severe COVID-19, but only one antiviral is actually approved for tackling coronavirus. That's Remdesivir. Desivir, a drug originally developed to treat hepatitis C, and it's made by Gilead Sciences, who are a large manufacturer of antivirals based in California. On Wednesday, Telegraph subscribers dialed into a really interesting coronavirus update on vaccines and treatments with medical experts and with our own global health security team. And on today's show, I'm going to play you some of that conversation because one of the people they heard from was the Vice President of Medical Affairs at Gilead Sciences. You're going to hear three voices, Paul Nuki, our global health security editor, Anne Gulland, our global health security deputy editor, both of whom you may have heard on this podcast, and Dr. Michael Elliott from Gilead, who started by explaining how their drug remdesivir treats the virus. So it works as an antiviral and just very quickly coronavirus really has two stages. The early stage is when the virus is reproducing very rapidly causing those you could call them severe flu-like symptoms the fever, the headaches, the cough, feeling like you're aching all over, needing to be in bed. That's the first week or 10 days then it progresses as your immune system takes over and starts to fight the virus, but also has impact on your multi-organ system. So it uh, can impact your kidneys, your liver, uh, your lungs more severely. And it's that early stage where the antiviral effects of remdesivir have the most effect rather than the later stage. And we found that borne out in all of the studies we've done, actually. Okay. Thanks for that. So I've got a question. So with the WHO, the World Health Organization, and its big um, solidarity trial, which was uh, 11,000 patients, they trialled remdesivir and found that it wasn't didn't have a huge benefit, but other trials have found benefit of remdesivir. So what is the sort of, from Gilead's point of view, obviously you're going to say that you think it's good, but what's your sort of view on what the benefit is and what it can do for patients? The benefits are, are, are very clear, and I think those two studies, at first blush, they might look to be contradictory, but they're not. Let me just go into that a little bit. So the studies I mentioned earlier, the very well-controlled, randomized, placebo-controlled studies, the standard for evaluating drugs and showing them to regulators to get a- approved if the data are there. Those studies we conducted and showed uh, clearly that in the early stage patients I described just now, you can reduce the duration of illness by five days. That five days, really important to the patient and their loved ones to reduce the symptoms and be able to get home. Also really important to the hospitals to have maybe that intensive care bed freed up for five days. That's a lot of money, five uh, days, isn't potentially it? Potentially a lot of money as well. And so that data is, is what we've used to get remdesivir's uh, early approvals around the world. The WHO study was a different study, really ambitious, really important to do. The two main aims of it were to treat a large number of patients around the world with coronavirus disease and just looking at one end point of mortality. So how many patients died on a number of treatments, one of which was indeed remdesivir. The group of patients, and these were recruited from around the world, both across Europe, the US, but also many patients, most patients in Africa, uh, South America and, and parts of Asia. And the group of patients was later in the disease and I described how you have the virus as most important in the early stage and and of lesser importance later on and the patients in the WHO are more in that middle stage to later stage of disease and the results were that we didn't see an effect on on mortality in the group treated with remdesivir and indeed that's not been a major finding in the studies we've done the mortality has been less impacted than that duration of illness and severity of illness. So I think the WHO study, really important study to do, and they achieved uh, what they set out to achieve. Uh, And I'd say it's in some way complementary to the other study results rather than directly contradictory. Well, President Trump got it, didn't he? Apparently so, yes. So it's it's a drug that has to be given relatively early in the uh, development of the disease. How readily available is it 
to patients entering hospital now in the UK? It, it's available. I mean, we've worked very hard to ramp up our manufacturing from that February start. We've gone from something like three or four factories to now 40 factories uh, around the world. And we reduced manufacturing time from 12 months to six months. Uh, we've greatly increased our logistics and supply chain. And we work very closely with the European Commission and government health systems around Europe in, in this case. So in the UK, Specifically, remdesivir has been uh, available since the beginning of the pandemic, but in much more supply as we've gone from sort of April, May through the summer and to where we are now. In short, it's available in the UK for the right patients. So tell me a little bit on the investment side. I'm just looking at the reader's questions coming in here. There's, there's some cynicism. <laughs> some cynicism. It's, not, it's not directed at Gilead. It's just general about big pharma. You know, how, how do we know Big Pharma isn't just making money? When do they start to profit? Maybe you could just address that, because when I was a regular sort of news desk journalist, I was also very cynical about Big Pharma. I've come to be a little bit more supportive as a health journalist. Tell us a little bit about how the business side of things interacts with the medical side. I'd say the pandemic actually gives, uh, you know, really puts that system under pressure and shows the value of Big Pharma, whether it's Gilead, who we're talking about with antivirals, or all of the vaccine companies. Uh, you know, so what we've done is before we really knew whether this medicine was going to work properly, we invested very heavily in our manufacturing capacity. You know, you can't open 40 factories at, at zero cost. We did all of that. The first 1.5 million vials we made of, uh, available free to be used so that people could get access to treatment un under medical care. And we've ramped up our supply chain globally. So we've given our intellectual property to nine generic manufacturers, mostly in India, to manufacture at bulk to make sure that the 127 least developed, least wealthy nations have access to remdesivir at a very low cost. And indeed, it's been shipped and used in 40 of those countries already. And that wouldn't happen without the funds we have made from previous medicines to invest in this new innovation. I, I think the model works. It certainly deserves to be tested and challenged. But again, on a, on a pricing basis for remdesivir, we set a global price for the developed world, uh, which has allowed us to quicker than we've ever before get access to all of the European countries, as an example, but also to the countries of Africa, Asia and other parts of the world which don't have the logistics or the research capabilities themselves. I've got a couple of questions myself and there's also some on the, on, that have been asked by the readers I notice. And also I just wondered what other potential treatments are there and potential antivirals there are out there that you think might be good and you talked about your library of antivirals as well that would be great other treatments are interesting and many of we're involved in research in many of these so combinations with remdesivir and other treatments i'm not sure if we talked about dexamethasone earlier but dexamethasone a very well established steroid works in that late stage of the disease um, and reduces mortality a very clear study from the group in oxford conducted across the uk shows that so other approaches fall into two or three categories. Immunological category, you have monoclonal antibodies have been tried. And so far, the data is, is I'd say, mixed to disappointing on those. And then also the pooled plasma approach, which you mentioned President Trump, so I can mention him as well. He, he received that. And the data is yet not, not at the stage of being mature. It's not like remdesivir that's been submitted to regulators with adequate data, the vaccines we've heard about, which I think are extremely close to that. So the data is still being evaluated. I think everyone hopes that there will be other drugs and approaches to add to remdesivir and dexamethasone, really the only two established, but those aren't there yet. But the, the pace of research is phenomenal. So I think during this year, probably more into the early parts of next year, we'll get more data readouts. Because there were some HIV drugs that were tried, weren't there? Was it? Long yeah, they were. They were tried and it was unsuccessful. Those were easy to test because those were readily available and were tested in the early months, and, and everyone held hope, but that didn't come through, unfortunately. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, do you think the treatments have been a bit disappointing, or that they have? You know, the vaccine. There's been massive amount of vaccine, obviously, but. Look, it would, I mean, again, and, and the, the timeline has been so telescoped. Normally, you'll develop drugs for a virus at the quickest in four to five years, more often seven to ten. So the fact that we've 
found out that dexamethasone works, an available medicine. We have Rendesivir that clearly works. And we have the vaccines now. We're all in the same calendar year. I can't call that disappointing. I think that's you know really positive. There's still more to do, but there is a lot of research. There were results out today from the UK ICU unit, so the Intensive Care Association put them out. And that shows that deaths and invasive treatments, putting people on ventilators and the like, has been cut in half in this second wave. I'm sure that's partly to do with treatments like remidisvir and steroids, but probably other things involved there, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've seen that data and actually earlier data suggesting that and actually talking to colleagues and friends in intensive care. They've learned a lot about the, let's say, the total care of the patient. So as, as you say, how to position them to support the breathing, when, when to use oxygen early, and when to consider a ventilator, probably later if, if you can do it. What other therapies to use apart from remdesivir and, and dexamethasone in, in the right patients? Uh, and, and just the total patient care. And do you think that's likely to continue to improve? Or is that, is that a sort of a quick wave of learning by intensive care doctors? Or, or, or will they hone that total care over time? I'm sure it'll be honed. The uh, you know, unfortunate truth is the pace of this virus and the number of cases um, has allowed them to very quickly gain a, a lot of experience in, in what works and maybe what doesn't work. You know, now they've got to crunch through all that data, publish it, as you mentioned today, get that published and reviewed. And, you know, intensive cares around the world will be sharing their experience to optimize. Uh, and again, that's something that normally in, an, in a normal disease would happen over years. And it's just been telescoped into this year. So more will come and more improvements for sure will come. When do you think it's all going to be over? When will our lives return to normal? I would have said, um, particularly now with the vaccine news, um, and again, vaccines aren't going to get to everyone they need to until probably the back end of next year. So I think by the time we get to next summer, um, we'll be feeling much more that the winter ahead of us will be more like a normal winter than this winter. Um, but I don't think we'll ever return exactly to where we were before. I think where we've, with everything suddenly having locked down, I think a whole a whole load of things will change, um, and many of them for the positive, actually. If you'd like access to exclusive live events like this, as well as our huge range of journalism, all the news that'll keep you up to date on the pandemic and everything else that'll distract you from it, head to telegraph.co.uk slash audio, where you'll see details of our subscriber sale for the next week, and you can save 20% on an annual subscription. The rest of the coronavirus latest news. University of Oxford scientists say they expect to report results from the late-stage trials of their vaccine by Christmas. Dr Andrew Pollard, an expert in paediatric infection and immunity, told the BBC research was slowed by low infection rates over the summer. But after a surge in cases, the Phase 3 trials are now gathering the data needed to report the results. Phase 3 is the final stage of trials before manufacturers seek regulatory approval. Eight countries, including Sri Lanka, Israel and Uruguay, have been added to England's quarantine-free list. People returning from countries including Namibia, Rwanda and the US Virgin Islands from Saturday will no longer have to self-isolate. The change doesn't affect those living in Wales, Northern Ireland or Scotland. Coronavirus has halted Brexit talks after a member of Michel Barnier's team tested positive. It's not clear for how long talks will be stalled or whether the EU's chief negotiator will have to self-isolate. If any of those stories have piqued your interest, you can read more on them by clicking on the links in the episode description. And if you have a question about the virus or a topic you think I should be covering, email me. The address is coronaviruspodcast at telegraph.co.uk or you can find me on Twitter at T underscore Leludis. This is Coronavirus, the latest from The Telegraph. I'm Theodora Leludis.